Mm -hmm. cool. And welcome to Fort Knox, live here at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Here with me at the NASDAQ, New York Times technology reporter Ed Lee. You might recognize him from uh, Recode, now is with Once the New York Times. Time. Yeah. yeah, congratulations. Thank you. A lot of Recode going on at the New York Times these days. Yeah, they, but, they like to poach. From. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Today we're talking about the, the movie business, the movie experience. We're going to start off talking a lot about uh, theaters. But before we get there, before we get there, you did a piece for the Times this week about the aftermath of AT&T buying Time Warner. What comes with Time Warner? Well, HBO. HBO, And huge. HBO, a lot of people might forget now with all this talk about Netflix, but HBO was that first premium content provider where people were going, oh, my goodness, there are these shows. You have to watch them, Sopranos. And even before that, some changes appear to be coming, changes are coming. for yeah, exactly. HBO. What are the changes? So um, you're, the context is exactly right. You, you nailed it, right? HBO is the service that, even if you didn't like every show, you, you recognize an HBO show for what it was. And it had sort of a certain quality, a certain intellectualism that, you know, it stood out for what it is. And that's why people want to go work for HBO. People want to produce shows and be, be, be seen in HBO shows for that very reason. Then Netflix comes along, right? Netflix comes along, and all of a sudden, they've got 50, 60 million U.S. subscribers, over 100 million around the world. And that's what everyone's talking about, and they're spending big dollars. So when AT&T comes in, they're basically saying, like, hey, look, without using the word Netflix, they're like, if you want to compete for tomorrow's world, I'm not saying you have to look like Netflix, but we have to be smarter about how we use the data. We have to make sure that it's not just 40 million people in the U.S. paying for it, but it's more like 60 million people in the U.S. paying for it. And I think that's the goalpost. How they get there, that's still an open question mark. Richard Plepper, the head of uh, uh, HBO, has been there for over 20 years. He's got to figure that out. But even he recognized, you know, for the future, they can't keep operating the way they have been. John Stanky from, from uh, AT&T came in and said, we need hours a day. Uh, quoting yeah. your article here, referring to the time viewers spend watching HBO programs. It's not hours a week, not hours a month. We need hours a day. You're competing with devices that sit in people's hands, that capture their attention every 15 minutes. Is there a danger, Ed, yeah. to HBO trying to get that granular? Because, I mean, there's an argument to be made. Sometimes people just want to sit back and watch something deep, but, you know, really deep content. I'm not necessarily looking at that every 15 minutes on my phone. Little funny stuff, sure, but do they risk diluting the brand? So that's a great question. I think that's what a lot of people, especially HBO consumers, were concerned about when they, when they saw the article. The, the reaction from the HBO faithful was astounding to me, actually. I didn't, real, I didn't think that they would react quite the way that they had. And I think, again, it goes back to this is what I know is my HBO. If you change it, that's bad. The thing of it is, is that there is a definite middle ground. There's no reason why HBO couldn't increase the number of shows and still be HBO and still create recognizable HBO shows in the vein and the quality that they're used to doing. And I think that's the goal there. Now, yes, could AT&T come in and, and sort of muck it up a little bit with the data and the information, all that kind of stuff? Yes. At this point, it probably only helps because HBO had always been hampered in its ability to spend. It had a corporate parent, Time Warner. They had to kick up profits. There was a dividend. AT&T has that too, but the Time Warner part now of AT&T represents a much smaller portion of their business. So they have mm -hmm. more room to grow, more room to experiment, room, more room to try different things. But tell me, though, strategically, Time Warner's big. Right. If you want to do every 15 minutes, you got a lot of brands in Time Warner that you could do yeah, every do 15 with. minutes with. Right. Why would you do that with HBO? So, no, that's a, gr that's a great question. I think um, the thinking is, and this is, it's not, the precise plan hasn't been set, is that, yes, I think they could take other parts of Warner and bundle it into some kind of an OTT service, some kind of a streaming service that includes a lot of HBO, but maybe there's some NBA basketball games, or maybe there's more boxing, or maybe there's other parts of the War now what's called Warner Media Empire that can sort of funnel into this service. Um, and HBO might be the anchor. And, and that's what's interesting. The HBO, of all these properties, is the one direct-to-consumer product that at and bought. It's something they could market right away. CNN, I mean, I don't see that something that people are buying over the top or through a streaming service just for CNN. It might be a good value-add to an existing bundle. It could be a value-add to sort of an HBO bundle almost. And I think that's sort of thinking out loud. That's probably what they're looking for. The criticism of TV kind of pre-HBO, I think, was that advertisers 
either directly or indirectly had too much influence over the content that was getting created. That you never would have gotten The Sopranos on mainstream television because it was too gritty, too bloody, frankly. Um, you, you, you could do a movie, but you can't tell a story that long in movie form. And then HBO and eventually Netflix sort of allowed these different types of stories to be told. Is there any similar concern now that the focus is on data and having data about the consumer? Is anybody talking or thinking about how the desire for granular data might influence the types of content that are created? Or is the thought, hey, engagement is engagement. As long as people like it, it's not going to influence the types of of content that people create? So that is that is the concern, right? So at one end of the spectrum, you have Netflix. And Netflix prides itself on its data, on its ability to find enough shows or to fund enough shows that they're going to find a whole array of, of interested people wanting to see it. They don't need multiple, multiple hits. They need hundreds of smaller hits, and then the audience will, will find itself there. That also shows you that in a bid to sort of create as much content as possible, Netflix is not in the business of developing, developing shows the way that HBO is. That's why from one original to the next, they all look really different. The aesthetic is different. That's because they sort of buy them lock, stock, and barrel. It, they buy these shows with producers, directors, scripts, actors attached. HBO, they start a lot of times with just, you know, an idea, and they develop throughout, which is why an HBO show looks like an HBO show from one to the other. They're going to have to figure a way to scale that without ruining the, the identity of it, and that, that's going to be the challenge. Yes, and a challenge for TV over the years has been to look a bit more, feel a bit more like movies, highly produced, premium content. So now let's talk about the movie experience, which arguably is the most premium media consumption experience. Joining us here at the NASDAQ, AMC Theater's president and CEO, Adam Aaron. He is also the former CEO of Starwood Hotels, former uh, CEO and co-owner of the Philadelphia 76ers as well. Adam, great to have you here. Lovely to be with you. So we really want to talk about this shift in the model of how people pay to go to the movies. Uh, we're becoming acquainted with it through a number of different brands. One of them is AMC's Stubbs A-List, which you guys just announced, um, what, a few weeks, Two weeks ago. ago. All right. You've had a business in Europe for a while, a couple of years now, uh, that's been under this model where basically people are paying every month for the opportunity to see a certain number of movies, uh, and then you don't know how many times they're going to show up. They get a little discount on popcorn and, and, and soda. Why is this important to do, and why is this going to be good for your business? Well, you're right. You know, AMC is the largest exhibitor in Europe, and for three years now, we've had a subscription program called Limitless in the United Kingdom and Germany. I have about 100,000 consumers over there who were paying us each month to go to an unlimited number of movies. Uh, we decided to bring that. We've been working on uh, bringing a program like that to the United States for about two years now. And two weeks ago, we did take it to market called AMC Stubbs A-List. It's a VIP tier of our loyalty program. Our loyalty program already has 15 million member households in it. And it is a great way to see movies because people lock in for a fixed price going to uh, a pretty healthy supply of movies over the course of a week, a month, uh, or a year. You know, I think it's a nice to have for our business. It's not crucial to our business uh, in the sense that the, in the United States, the movie theater industry last year sold around a billion movie tickets. Mm. A billion tickets. That's a lot of tickets. Mm -hmm. You take the attendance of every NFL team, every Major League Baseball team, uh, every NHL team, every NBA team, you multiply that times about 10, you got a billion tickets. Um, and these programs where it's kind of an all-you-can-eat, uh, go to see essentially not necessarily an unlimited number of movies, but in our case, 13 three. movies a month is a lot of movies, right? right. Is it three, three a week? week? Three a week. Not how many people go to more than three movies a week. You know? <laughs> not how many people go to three movies a month. But having said that, um, this is still going to be a small part of our business. I do believe that the lion's share of our business, the vast lion's share of our business, is still going to be the old-fashioned way of buy a ticket one movie at a time. But for people who like these kind of programs, AMC now has it for them. You, you've had this uh, up and running in Europe for a few years already, as you pointed out. What do the economics of that look like? I, there, there's a, a group of power users that may cost you money, and then the rest of them sort of pay for that. Is that sort of the model? What does that ratio look like generally amongst the subscriber base? So let me tell you what this isn't. 
This isn't gym memberships where people buy these things and, and then they, they, never, them, right? they never show up at the gym. <laughs> Actually, this is the opposite. Yeah, people are going to the movies instead of going to the gym. Uh, that's, that's, let's hope. <laughs> and having some of our very reasonably priced popcorn. <laughs> right. yeah, so, yeah. The, um, and now you can have a drink, too. You can have, you can have liquor. <laughs> very nice. Uh, Not just Coca-Cola anymore. You can have a gin and tonic. Um, the, uh, our people actually use these programs. So for us, it's the opportunity to give a small discount to a consumer to get a large amount of money out of their wallet. So on average, let's say that before we launch a subscription program in Europe, people would go to one movie a month. They're now roughly paying for two movies a month, but they're going to two and a half movies a month, maybe three movies a month, uh, maybe two and a quarter movies a month. So they're getting a bit of a discount, but they're using this thing. This is spurring incremental movie going because if you think about it, once you paid your money on the 1st of September, every movie that you go to after that, the marginal cost is free. So in, right now, the, the decision a consumer has to make is I'm investing my money and investing my time. Given that it's a fixed price and it's locked in and there's no incremental cost to go to the second movie or the third or for that matter, the ninth, uh, the incremental decision is the investment of their time but not investment of their cash. So in our view, it's something where everybody wins. Um, we were getting uh, paid by the average consumer to see a movie. Well, now they're spending more than that, but they're seeing a lot more than two movies worth. So, one so of the they're getting a deal. That we business reporters like to do is look at the financial documents of a company, uh, the annual uh, report 10K. And I was looking at that for 2017. Your most profitable line, it looks like, is food and beverage. I mean, you know, what food and beverage costs you versus what you end up getting in in revenue, pretty nice spread. Now, interestingly, you've said that these Stubbs A-list uh, type customers are going to end up spending less per visit on food and beverage, but I guess that gets made up for by the fact that they're showing up more often? Yeah, exactly. So you are right. Uh, food and beverage is about half of our business. We actually make half our income by selling movie tickets. Mm -hmm. We make about half our income selling concessions, food and drink. Um, the margins on the food and drink are like pretty impressive. They're around eighty-five percent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most wow. Most, that is astounding. Most. Yeah. I bought the ten-dollar popcorn. Yeah. I always of course. Yeah. What else are you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> Eight seventy-five. Okay. <laughs> um, but you get a lot of popcorn. You do. You get free butter, right? Yeah. And you get a big smile on your face. Share it with right. the kids. Who yeah, doesn't absolutely. like popcorn? All right. So, uh, yes, it's high margin. Our own estimates, and we don't know that our estimates are going to prove out to be accurate, although we do know what in the United States, we do know what the history has been in the United Kingdom. So if the United States consumers act as UK consumers did, then we know exactly what's going to happen. Um, what we've seen, uh, uh, AMC does have the highest food and beverage capture, highest food and beverage spend of any of the major chains right now, because mm. we put a lot of effort into having great food and beverage offerings. For example, our concession stands have a lot more menu variety than our competitors. We put Coke Freestyle machines in every one of our U.S. theaters, hundred and more than 180 flavor choices. We got full alcoholic bars in half our theaters in the United States. So it's no surprise that we're doing better. But, you know, if you were going to the movies once a month, maybe you'd splurge a little bit more. If you're going to movies two or three times a month, maybe more than that, yeah, you might spend a little less per visit, but as you say, there are more visits, so it's, and it's a very profitable part of our business. If it's a volume play for the subscribers, even if you're making a little bit less profit on each one, right. you're then kind of reliant on, on the movie slate, right? Are there enough movies coming every month to sort of, to sort of entice these subscribers to come back more, more frequently? You know, that's the great story of 2018. <laughs> um, and uh, excuse me for giving you a long answer, but it's really an important question. Hollywood, if you go back to the year 2000, the Hollywood industry-wide box office in the United States has been growing about 3% a year for, for 18 years. Right. And it, the pattern has been, it's in this pattern has happened five times in a row, two strong or flat years, mostly strong, followed by a down year. That's happened five times in a row. And the fourth year of that three-year cycle, so to speak, was always a really big up year. Well, 2017, the fifth time in a row, was a down year. 2015 was a record box office. 2016 was a record box office. 2017, the industry box office was down about 
Actually, the year started really big, January to April. It ended really big, September, December. The industry had a pretty miserable May to August. It was a slump. It's a creative industry. Some movies don't make it. Right. Uh, a bear case emerged around the movie industry last summer in that May to August four-month slump. And it was up. Oh, no one's going to the movies ever again. I don't care they sold a billion tickets last year. Uh, in the era of Netflix, no one's going to go to a theater. Everybody's watching movies at home, streaming. It turns out that that bear case is just wrong. Because starting with September of 17, September was the biggest September in movie history. December was the biggest December in history. February, Black Panther was the biggest February in movie history. April was the biggest April in movie history. June was the biggest June in movie industry history. As it turns out, January to June, the industry box office, which, you know, in a really good year might grow 3%, grew 11% year over year, wow. January to June. The second quarter, April to June, the industry box office in the United States and Canada, that's how we all measured the so-called domestic box office, was the biggest quarter for movie going in the 100-plus year history of wow. cinema. And so why? Because Hollywood gave us a great slate of movies. If you I got uh, yeah. and, and uh, your, your point is well taken. I got to squeeze in one more for sure. you because it's a point that you've made about uh, Stubbs A list. You're charging closer to twenty bucks a month for right. this versus Movie Pass closer to ten. But you said it's important that you make this a premium uh, program and one that's financially sustainable. What's wrong with Movie Pass's model? Well, if, if you define, like, I don't want to talk about Movie Pass per se. I, but say uh, Brand X that's uh, charging ten dollars. I understand. Um, <laughs> who might that be? Um, look, we've liked the subscription product and the subscription concept. We've had one in the United Kingdom for three years. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to charge any company in any industry needs to charge more for their product than it costs them to deliver the product. <laughs> And by MoviePass's own admission, they lost $40 million in May. They lost $45 million in June. Um, uh, we said on the first day they slashed their price to $10 a month that we thought that there's nothing wrong with, with a subscription concept, but the price point they picked was not sustainable. Our view has not changed one iota since last August. And when we had the opportunity to launch, to take a program to market, we put it in the marketplace at a price that we thought would be profitable, would be sustainable. We've already estimated that for every million members in our program, if we get to a million members, it's 15 to $25 million a year of incremental EBITDA for AMC. Uh, and we believe at a $20 price point, ours is a viable, sustainable model where we will make money by having this program. Mm. And we believe, and I think empirically the facts are clear, that if you charge half of what we're charging, you're going to lose money, and that's a problem. I would just further add that we just didn't take the same program to market that they had. Our program, in our view, has a lot of features that are superior. Uh, you can book in advance. You can book online. Uh, you can reserve specific seats. Uh, you uh, No surge pricing. No surge pricing. <laughs> um, uh, you can go see movies in, in IMAX, Dolby, 3D. You can see more than one movie in a day. You can see the same movie over and over again. There, are, You get the full benefit of all the VIP services wow. of the AMC Stubbs program. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that make our program better. But here's the most important thing. Our program's been around for a long time because our program's going to be profitable. Uh, and if consumers are looking for something that they can rely on that offers uh, really attractive features and a great price, and great consumer value. We've got it. And then right, just well, to end, it, uh, end <laughs> it on this, you asked about movies. we got really big movies coming out in July. Uh, 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 one good film. We have five good ones coming out in the next two weeks. Mamma Mia, That's Mission long, yeah. Impossible, <laughs> Equalizer, <laughs> right. Hotel Transylvania 3. Wow, you got uh, the memorized. Right. Skyscraper. <laughs> That's Go check out a movie in November called First Man, starring uh, Ryan Gosling, uh, directed by Damien Chazelle, who did La La Land. It's the story of Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. 
Disney Fantastic. has got a remake of Mary Poppins coming out in December. I've seen might, the trailers. Might be the biggest movie of the year. At an AMC theater, I would add. Thank you. The seats recline. I yes, enjoy that. And you're, Adam, th thanks for coming all the way out here to the NASDAQ. Adam Aaron, the uh, CEO of AMC. It's been great. Now, I want to get out and talk to Julia Borston. She's live in Sun Valley, Idaho, talking deals. Hey, somebody's got to make all these movies, right, Julia? Yes, although interestingly, John, there hasn't been that much talk about movies because there's been so much focus here on the content where that's coming out internationally, especially with the, the latest bid for Sky, um, and also digital video content um, when you look at what's happening with Hulu and then also the digital assets um, and the traditional assets in television companies like Discovery Communications, which are considered acquisition targets right now. So, Julia, um, what's your sense of the appetite for spending on content right now. We were just talking about uh, Ed Lee's great story uh, about AT&T and, and their coming influence over HBO, but what they want on the other side of the deal, is, is that a common theme? Well, you know, it's been it's been interesting because, of course, everyone here is talking about the impact of that AT&T acquisition of Time Warner, which, of course, includes HBO, yep. and then what deals are going to come next. And so it was really interesting talking to Steve Case, who 20 years ago did the AOL Time Warner deal. And he said he thinks that, obviously, Time Warner is in a very different place, much more slimmed down company than it was back then. But he did speak to the challenges of integrating um, these two different kinds of companies, media um, and, and technology, and how there are some inherent challenges there in terms of the cultural combination. Um, but in terms of the value of content, it seems like it's never been higher. I spoke with Discovery Communications CEO Dave Zaslav. I know I just mentioned Discovery. And it's because he was so enthusiastic about what all these higher valuations for content companies mean for his company. There's a lot of, uh, uh, of talk here about how the fact that Sky's valuation is, and, and Fox Fox's valuation continue to rise indicates that premium content um, is is a is you know hugely valued right now, and also it, there's scarce resources. When if you want to buy a premium content company, there just aren't that many out there, and I think that's why we are seeing both Comcast and Disney really fight over these Fox and Sky assets because if you especially if you want to have um, access to the European market, Sky is particularly valuable, and if you want premium content, there are a handful of companies that people are talking about right now. Buy common CBS. Maybe those could be in play if Sherry Redstone is willing to let them go. Um, but a lot of movement and talking right now. Hey, uh, Julia, it's Ed here. Nice to see you out there. It's, um, you know, you got, you've been going out there for years. I've been going out there for years as well. It's always sort of the, the great moment to see all, all the big moguls in their vests walking around. Is there, what's the feeling this year? <laughs> Given all the sort of the tensions that are happening between Brian Roberts and Iger, both trying to get Rupert's business and then also between Sherry Redstone and Les Moonves, they're all there right now. You, do you see them rubbing shoulders? Do you see them waving? What's they're it like? all what's the there mood? right now. Well, I just saw Les Moonves. I separately saw Sherry Redstone. I've talked about them separately. I have not seen them in the same place. It's very different from a couple years ago when Les Moonves was effectively like showing Sherry Redstone around and introducing her to people. Now I've not seen them in the same place. Um, we have seen Rupert Murdoch as well as Brian Roberts. Um, we have not seen Bob Iger yet, but it's possible that he's here and he's just busy working um, on his deal. Because, um, of course, Disney is acting in concert with Fox as Fox made that higher bid for Sky. So all of the players are here. Um, and there's a lot of excitement about the idea that in the wake of that AT&T um, Time Warner deal, that it's really open season for M&A right now. And there is much less concern about regulatory approval. Um, and so it, I, I really haven't seen this kind of excitement here about things really happening after this conference um, in many years. Well, yeah, we see a lot of the, uh, the media luminaries heading in there, as well as our own boss, uh, Brian Roberts. I saw the CEO of Comcast as well. Julia, great reporting, as always, from out there in Sun Valley. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Fort Knox Live here at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, live on Periscope, Facebook, YouTube, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV. Ed Lee of the New York Times is with me and joining us now from 30 Rock in Midtown, New York, MoviePass CEO Mitch Lowe. He is also former president at Redbox and a co-founding executive at Netflix itself. No stranger to disruption, as we were just <laughs> discussing with Julia. Mitch, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Glad, glad to be here. Well, uh, I mean, MoviePass certainly has shaken things up 
quite a bit. And uh, yeah. you guys are gaining a lot of attention, putting a lot of butts in movie seats, a decent percentage of uh, the, the tickets being sold in this very popular movie season and movie year coming in through movie, uh, movie Pass. But my goodness, how long can you lose money at this? What, what's changing? And is this, is this surge pricing thing going to help make this sustainable for the movie pass lover? Yeah, you know, I think the thing that people miss is that the group of people who've been going to the movies less and less often are the 200 million plus Americans who essentially are only going to four or five movies a year. And we priced our product to motivate them to go twice as often to go from spending 40 to $50 a year to spending 120 So this is all about slowly but surely getting a higher and higher percentage of our subscribers from what is what the MPAA calls the occasional moviegoer group. So every month uh, we get closer and closer to breaking even and with our subscriber base. And, and it is not going to be that much longer uh, until that happens. Um, hey, I, this is Ed Lee here. I had a question for you. Mitch. The, um, yeah. You guys have been often compared to Netflix in, in terms of the model of being, you know, a low-cost subscriber-based system. And, you know, I think people flock to it because of it was a, a relatively low cost. The difference, though, model-wise, I mean, for Netflix, they could be spending $8, 10 $12 billion a year on programming, but they own that content afterwards, or largely they do. So the next right. time I, as a consumer, watch it on Netflix, I'm not costing Netflix anymore. Whereas with MoviePass, every time I go, it costs you mm -hmm. something. So can, yeah. can you explain a little bit the economics of that, where you figured out who's costing you money and where you're making it back? Sure. And, you know, the, the true comparison is to the uh, Netflix movies by mail model, uh, where you paid uh, 1595 and you got three or four movies a month uh, on DVD that you could exchange as often as you wanted. Um, in those days, Netflix was paying both a royalty, uh, mailing costs, uh, operational costs, and typically was spending about $2 or more every time a customer ordered a disc. When you had three or four out, you could exchange them 20, 30, 40 times a month. But yet what we saw is that people used it to discover, used it to remove the anxiety of trying new product, which they wouldn't have ever rented at Blockbuster. So, and then over time, it became profitable. In fact, the most profitable component of Netflix today is still the movies by mail service. So the real comparison is, is, is more to that. It's not to owning so, the content. So Mitch, though, what is the primary strategic asset? Because when we talk about mm -hmm. Netflix and what's expected to make it special into the future, it's the data. It's their yeah. uh, ability to know what people are going to want to watch and leverage uh -huh. that into making better decisions into the future. Certainly, MoviePass is going to have data about uh, how often people are going to the movies, mm -hmm. perhaps what they're watching. Is that data yeah. going to factor into your model in any way, maybe selling other things or offering other services as well? Yeah, well, just just look at it today. You know, we have bought uh, over 5% of all the movie tickets this year to date since uh, January 1st to uh, the end of the second quarter. Uh, half of that is incremental to the business, plus the the friends that they bring mean that we're responsible for about a third of the 9% lift in the box office this year compared to last year. Now, when we promote a film, and we promote films because we have this relationship with our subscriber where they want good ideas of small films that marketing didn't sell them on. When we market a film, we're buying 15 and 20 percent of the nation's tickets for that film. And not just, you know, and I'm including, you know, AMC and Cinemark and so on. So that incremental lift is what studios are paying us to do for them. We have a more effective marketing machine than many others. Um, and, it, and I often say it's not because we're marketing geniuses, it's because our subscribers have no incremental cost of taking our advice. So, so really what our, our data does, just like Netflix, is we're able to get people to go see films that otherwise they never would have seen. In fact, they often say, I would have just waited for Netflix or Amazon Prime to see them. We're actually getting them to go see them in the movie theater. Are they, um, 
Are the movie chains, are, are, you, are you making friendly with movie chains now? Do they, do they see you guys as, uh, as, as a benefit to their business uh, now versus not too long ago they saw you guys as, <laughs> as bizarrely as the competition? Well, you know, I think the ones who work with us are seeing a 100, 200, 300, and even a 400 percent in increase in, in their tickets uh, that they're selling as a result of, uh, of us activating customers. There's a, a couple of major chains. You know, by major, I don't mean Cinemark, AMC, or Regal, but there's some pretty good sized chains out there that we're buying 20% of their tickets. And mm -hmm. whereas a year ago, we weren't buying any. So slowly, as they, as they work with us, and you know, it's, um, it's an industry that's been relatively slow to innovate. I mean, all the things that are happening today, you know, with AMC, you know, we're really proud of because, you know, we have really been trying to re-energize uh, the business, trying to get more people to go see films in the theater and ideally see those small independent films that, that people have been overlooking. So, so we, you know, when a, when a theater chain works with us, they are thrilled. In fact, they are, they tell us over and over again, they're surprised. <laughs> but it's been a slow, it's been slow because, you know, it's hard to get people to uh, do things differently from the way they've done them in the past. Well, I, I guess the one clear winner in all of this is somebody who wants to go see a lot of movies. I mean, yeah. right now, no, no, no downside in that. Mitch Lowe uh, from Movie Pass, thank you so much for joining us, giving My us a, a good idea of some of the things between sure. between AMC and Movie Pass, we got lots of ideas of what lots, we can do. Lots of ways to can. watch more movies for sure. Are you going to subscribe to one of these things? You know what? I'm still not there yet. I'm not. Uh, I, who has the time? <laughs> if, the if I'm going, I'm going with the whole family. Right. Right. You got to get it by a whole three person, four right. person subscription. We're not right. all going to subscribe. Right. Am I really going to go that many times a month? You know, I'm the one. I'm buying the huge tub of popcorn, and we're splitting it among four people. Yeah. Some people call that a cheapskate. I prefer to think of myself <laughs> as economical. Economical, yes, efficient. absolutely. I'm with you on that, for sure. <laughs> What's next, Ed, you think, in, in these uh, content gyrations that we're seeing, whether it's in TV, whether it's in movies, from M&A to the funding of content to the perhaps blowing up for at least few frequent moviegoers of the movie theater business model? I think that, including with the guests that you've had on, uh, I think it, it's definitely content is moving towards the direct-to-consumer model, mm -hmm. you know, which is what Netflix essentially pioneered in a lot of ways. And what Disney now is trying to do after, you know, if it wins the Fox deal, they and Comcast and everyone else, what they're going to try to do is just sell the content more directly. What that means also is that there are fewer middlemen, right, in this sort of supply chain, so to speak. And I think... Um, if you're a distributor, you're, you're focused on, well, how do I offer better broadband service? How do I offer better data services? Uh, and if you're a content producer, it's like, okay, I'm going to now sell it directly to consumers. There will be other middlemen in that too, but more behind the scenes, less visible. And I think that's a trend we're going to see in media and tech going forward. Cutting out the middleman yep. always goes through that phase. Ed Lee of the New York Times, thanks for joining me. Anytime. This has been Fort Knox Live. From the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, talking entertainment, uh, be sure to check out the podcast. This past week, did a little something different, a little best of, a little retro. Look at CEOs who are no longer CEOs who I've had on the podcast. So, my goodness, we had CEOs from Intel, WPP, and more. Be sure to check that out on the podcast, fortnox.com. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.